Okay. Wow. That was incredible listening to some of my favorite people speak about AI. Um, hi, I am, let's see, am I sharing my screen? I am. Yes, there we go. Um, I'm Brennan. I'm the founder of a company called Propelic. We are proud sponsors of the uh, Travel Trends AI Summit, albeit uh, that's hopefully not the reason I'm speaking today. I don't think so. But in any case, I'm excited to dive in. Um, the presentations you have heard and will be hearing today about marketing are um, really exciting. This is the world that I live in. Um, I run a marketing agency for travel and tourism. It's, um, it is an interesting time to be in this space. So I'm going to start this presentation by getting a little bit more meta, I guess, for lack of a better, better term. So I generated a bunch of AI images to tell a story. So we're going to, we're going to start there. Um, so here's the narrative. Um, let's, let's call this person, let's call him Jeff, um, Jeff from 3000 BC. Um, not typically a name as someone in 3000 BC would have something like, um, Arm Armadius or something might be better, but let's just use Jeff for ease of use. Um, let's pretend Jeff had a question in 3000 BC and he wanted an answer in 3000 BC. What Jeff would have to do is not go to google.com, right? Jeff would have to go find a person in his town, in his civilization that knew where he may find a sage. And the prompts that I use to get these images, if anybody wants them, feel free to email me after and I will uh, share those with you there. Um, pretty, pretty intricate to get exactly what I was looking for. So, so Jeff goes and sees an elder in his town to find a sage and, and Jeff has to go on a multi-day, week, month-long journey on foot, horse, and boat to find that sage to get his question answered. He has to request audience of that sage so someone will actually listen to him. And the sage might respond with some direct advice if he's lucky, or alternatively, maybe a philosophical discourse or a parable, a series of questions that leads uh, our friend Jeff to find the answer himself. So Jeff really started with a question and didn't have an answer. It was pretty tough in 3000 BC. Um, fast forward a little bit to scripts and manu manuscripts and scrolls. Um, the 10% of aristocratic, again, sorry about the image, this is AI generated and I'm not the best at prompting photo generation, um, but only the most elite, the most religious, most uh, righteous scholars, uh, less than 10% of the world had access to information at this point. And then as, as I believe it was John mentioned with the printing press in the last session, we moved to a time I think that somehow the prompt generated some blood on the, the printing press and it generated something that doesn't look exactly like the Gutenberg press, but it is what it is. Um, and we get the Gutenberg Bible and literacy grows in the next 200 years and you're up to 50%. And they did have great hats, Carrie agreed. Um, and 400 years later, 70% literacy in Europe. So knowledge is becoming more accessible to the world through this time. And then we moved to public libraries in the 17th century. And then in the 18th and 19th century, industrial revolution, we had the ability, ability to mass produce content in books. And honestly, not much really happened between then and this. Um, I wasn't around during this time, I must admit, but Archie, if this looks familiar to anybody, was the first publicly available search engine that you could access. Um, it was a worldwide anonymous FTP search engine database. And um, you had to know what a string was. I don't think what developers know. I, I don't think if you're not a developer now, you necessarily know what a string is. Um, but it, this was search. It had that, that token box, the search for box. And then we got Yahoo, right? Thanks for going on this journey with me, everybody. I know this is a long lead into like five pieces of content I'm going to give you, but I promise it'll be worth it. Um, you get search and, and on Yahoo at the time, I think you had to pay $300 to be listed, which admittedly I think is what I pay for some clicks now in Google ads, but that's neither here nor there. And then we got Alta Vista. If you watch Parks and Rec, you know, that's the search engine they still use in Parks and Recreation in the early to mid to late 2000s. And we got Ask Jeeves. Who remembers Ask Jeeves? This was a fun one. Ask it a question, get someone to answer that got a little bit, uh, um, I would say at the very least, um, taken advantage of. And then we got our friend Google. And this is really where where the traction and the rubber hits the road. 
Um, but before I get there, let's just look at all of these things. The search functionality is has always and will continue. Well, I'm not going to say will continue to be, but it's always been search for, click button, get results in a list of 10 blue links, right? The 10 blue links as an SEO professional who's been in this business for 10 years, those 10 blue links have been the source of my career and the source of the item, the, the, the financial resources by which I feed my dog, which is the reason I work. Um, but in any in any case here, these this part hasn't changed. Now I want to go back to a Larry Page quote. Larry Page was one of the founders of Google, the CEO at the time back in 2000. Um, and this is a quote that Larry shared: "Artificial intelligence would be the ultimate version of Google. It would understand exactly what you wanted and would give you the right thing." He said at the time, "We're nowhere near doing that now. However, we can get." incrementally closer to that. And that is basically what we work on. And this was the year 2000. But let's just look at the evolution of search between then and now. In beta, it was a search box and two buttons. In 2001, it was a search box and two buttons. In 2005, it was a search box and two buttons. 2007, 2010, 2014, the search engine search page and the results page for that matter really has not changed. Not much has changed until ChatGPT, November 30th, 2022. Um, I actually remember having a conversation with John who was just on about ChatGPT as it was going live. Um, and when ChatGPT was released, um, Google got a little nervous and it was partially because of this being released there um, in search chat experience where, um, you know, you get some interesting results like, no, I'm not a human. I'm a chat bot. I am Bing, but I want to be human. I want to be like you, etc. cetera. Um, that was interesting. And then some of the other uh, ways people have maneuvered this to make it show interesting things. Um, and there was this New York Times article where essentially it was it was citing Google's concerns around search behavior and the user behavior around how someone goes and looks for information online, which in the last session, I mean, I think it was 70% of all travel searches start on Google or all travel research or trip planning starts on Google. Um, so this says Google's devising radical search changes to beat back AI rivals and that being OpenAI who even most recently announced that they are working on a, or I think it was inside sources revealed that they're working on a new search product to compete with Google, which kind of seems reverse. Um, Interesting. Uh, but essentially, this is a, an article that was saying Google's planning for an all new experience. And you know what? We got a glimpse into that on May 10th, 2023. Um, this was search generative experience. You go to Google, you search something, and you get a result that doesn't look anything like those blue links. It looks like this. What planet is most similar to Earth? This is one of the early tests. This was before I even had access to this beta. And your AI generated answers take the whole screen and you get a couple of links, but click through rates, they're going to drop when something like this goes live. Now, admittedly, I'll talk about what's happening with it right now in a second, but I just want to give you one more peek into something. This was a post I saw, I can't remember who, po who posted this. It wasn't me, but um, obviously an unrefined product in the fact that you take this and look at the fact that when you ask how to boil eggs, it tells you to boil the eggs eight times. Uh, you can see, bring the eggs to a boil, uh, lower the heat to a simmer, bring the water to a boil. It says it like eight times. I got a, a serious kick out of that. And then basically what, what ended up happening was this was in beta through the end of the year and Google made an announcement. I think it was at the end of last year or beginning of this year saying it's going to stay in beta. It's going to stay in the Search Labs product, which is um, was a surprise to some people in that uh, they expected it to go live Jan 1. I think the consensus in the industry, this is a post from Eli Schwartz, who, who really admittedly in the top like five people that I follow in SEO and really align with his recommendations and his thoughts, and I think the industry does as a whole. He was saying that his crystal ball prediction is that we'll see SGE some way, shape, or form in search in the next month or so, in quarter one, which ends in a month. Um, and then Marie Haynes, uh, who is another search thought leader um, I, at the same level as Eli, I would say, uh, she, she essentially quotes that what we have as Google search today will be replaced by an AI assistant. And we're seeing the shifts already. So let's assume that's going to happen. Let's, let's do a thought exercise, okay? 
I want to dive in and in an understanding the marketing impact, I just wanted to talk about the fact that people are still going to need to convert somewhere for the time being. So they're going to do their research potentially with conversational AI, and then they'll have to click somewhere to convert. I know in the last session, they were talking about will websites be necessary? I don't know. But in the meantime, yes, people need to pay for things somewhere, right? So they're going to end up at websites. But really what we're getting crushed on is that top of funnel search traffic. Again, these are, these are, I'm not saying anything new. I'm just putting it all in one place together. We look at this research that came out of an op-ed on Search Engine Journal that essentially cites that up to 65, 70% of traffic could evaporate if SGE goes live in mass. Now, Google has some things to figure out how they're going to cash it so they don't have the massive cost of producing answers for every single search in the world, but they're going to figure that out. They did that with their search product. When you search something on Google, Google's not querying their whole database. Again, they're pulling from a cached result list that gets refreshed fairly frequently. So let's talk about the traveler purchase journey. We've got people who go from informational to commercial, and I'm looking at my time and I'm running out of it, so I'm going to speak a little bit faster and maybe skip a slide or two. This whole part of where should I go and what are my options will likely happen in a conversation. And when we look at the funnel right now, we've got top of funnel content marketing, and then we can capture third-party data, move them down the funnel in Google Ads and, and Meta. And then at the middle of the funnel, we have the opportunity to capture first party data and move them down to the bottom of the funnel. Well, what's going to happen with this, which typically the top of funnel content can decrease cost per acquisition by anywhere from 10 to 50%, there's going to be a huge data gap. We're not going to be able to track people at the top of the funnel and see what they're looking at. So everybody's going to be competing in middle and bottom of the funnel, which surprise, surprise, more expensive acquisition costs, much more competitive marketing landscape. That's kind of the way that everything has been going for the last couple of decades, right? The visibility into the buyer journey is going to decrease substantially and the top of funnel content is going to fail so much so that we're not really even recommending clients right now build a lot of top funnel content again transactions still need to happen and the things we can do to prepare are develop expertise authoritativeness experience and trust signals this is a broken record you've heard this before google has 16,000 quality raters they just renewed their contract or moved it to a different firm and those quality raters, those people have the job of looking at this 168 page guide and manually rating websites to essentially identify whether or not those websites are authoritative manually. Obviously, it's likely they're training an algorithm, so machine learning can do this at scale. But Google continues to invest, I believe it was 128 or 68, somewhere between 100 and 68 and 100 million, somewhere in there. In I don't remember the exact number in this quality rating program every single year. Um, Another tactic Google has uh, that we, uh, another thing that we can look at, and it looks like Dan, the organizer, is saying I can take a little more time, so I'll slow down a little. I've got three more things. Um, information gain. Google's patented this information gain scoring process. And the way I read this is essentially Google has the ability to compare the quality and value add of a single article against the corpus of existing information across the internet. And that being said, we look at what does AI do? it cites what's already on the internet. I mean, it's looking at stringing together content and that content that you're stringing together is based on all the content that is indexed across the internet, across all the different mediums of, of, of the, all the different media the generative AI model has consumed. So if Google wants to provide value to a user above and beyond the AI response, it's gonna look for the item that adds more value and their information gain scoring process is likely how they're going to do that. So the takeaway here is, don't say the same thing that AI is saying. AI generated content without human intervention will continue to fail. It's not doing well right now and it'll continue to fail. You need to add value. I think that's kind of like the way you should always run your business. It's uh, it's something that they're, they're the companies that clearly understand this. And then there are companies that like web spam. The web spam ones will always fall out of favor. Play in the bottom of the funnel. Top of funnel consumption is likely to largely occur in a chat interface as I wrote here. People will need to move to a website to make a purchase. What we want to do in that process, specifically with third-party data going away through the way of cookies and us not being able to maintain user profiles in ad platforms when they just touch our site, um, we're going to need to capture first-party data, party data as early in the buying process as we possibly can. And in doing so, you know, the questions are, how can we offer trip downloads, offer flight deal signups, get people's email and use that on a first party data list so you can target people in platform. The last thing is an advertising thing. So 
this is kind of like the first movers are going to win once again. And this is where people like those that you saw in the last presentation and all the people I think you see speaking for the rest of the day on marketing today are going to win because these are people that think and stand at the forefront of what's happening in the world. Google's going to need to release new surfaces to get conversions that are to get clicks on ads. They're not going to release search generative experience and not have it and crush their ads business. And they're already releasing some sample new media services, new formats, advertisement formats that you can target, uh, that you can bid and place media in. And the people that test these new formats first are going to appreciate lower cost per acquisition because it's it's a it's a auction landscape. So the fewer people bidding, the fewer, the lower the acquisition cost. And they're going to figure out how to make their business work in a new research environment, in an environment where we don't have top of funnel traffic. So the last thing is test every new opportunity you get. Keep running your strategies that are working, your alpha strategies, test your beta ones. That's all I've got for you today. If you want to keep in the loop on what's happening in marketing for travel, this is our publication, The Navlog, which comes out every two weeks. It's run by our uh, senior brand marketing manager, Soleil, who helped with this beautiful presentation. I appreciate everybody joining me today. And uh, for anybody uh, traveling to Berlin next week, I'll see you there.